morning. If you're able to, please remain standing for the reading of God's word. Today we're going to be reading from John chapters, chapter 15, verses 18 through 27, and chapter 16, 1 through 4, and Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 14. If the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. If you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Remember the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. If they kept my word, they will also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name, because they do not know him who sent me. If I had not come and spoken to them, they would not have been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Whoever hates me hates my father also. If I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. But the word that is written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause." But when the Helper comes, whom I will send to you from the Father, the Spirit of truth, who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. And you also will bear witness, because you have been with me from the beginning. I have said all these things to you to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of the synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. And they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you, that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Philippians chapter 4, 11 through 14. Not that I am speaking of being in need, for I have learned in whatever situation I am to be content. I know how to be brought low, and I know how to abound. In any and every circumstance, I have learned the secret of facing plenty and hunger, abundance and need. I can do all things through him who strengthens me. Yet it was kind of you to share my trouble. This is the word of the Lord. Good morning. All right. Um, Does anyone know where the tablet is for the slides? (laughs) This morning, as we are going to light uh, the Advent candles, the the first Advent candle is, uh, it represents our hope. And then that second Advent candle represents uh, joy. And uh, this morning, this third Advent candle that we are going to light represents peace. And um, I, was, I was thinking about it. I, I leaned over to Reeve this morning as Jenny was reading. I was like, you know, it says the world is going to hate you. And I was like, hey, Merry Christmas. Like, <laughs> this, is our, this is our Christmas text. And uh, I love teaching through the Bible because you, you teach all of it. And when you teach through all of it, you get God's word, not uh, man's word. So thank you. So this morning, uh, welcome to Regeneration Church. If you are online, don't tune out like, oh man, this is going to be intense. Uh, I think there's going to be some things that are going to be really helpful for all of us. And so I'm going to pray this morning as uh, we get into our message, maintaining peace in difficult times. Let's pray. Father, this morning, uh, we are coming to the end of a tumultuous year, uh, a year, Lord, where... um, where there are wars and rumors of wars, uh, there is strife, there's difficulties, and yet, Lord, we know that you've come, that we might have peace, and you said that your peace you give to us, not as the world gives. So, Lord, we ask that you would remind us and then teach us, remind us of what that means, and then teach us how we receive that kind of peace and how we live in that peace in the middle of difficulties. 
So, Father, we give you this time. I pray for those that are watching online this morning that you would minister to them and that they would be able to set time apart to be able to hear you, free of distraction. We pray for those that are here in the sanctuary this morning that you would speak to us. And we thank you. We thank you for your goodness. Lord, may we always lead um, with gratitude, uh, remembering uh, your love for us. In Jesus' name, amen. Amen. This morning, uh, I also wanted to remind you, as we go through Advent Conspiracy, Advent Conspiracy really is when we, um, we try to spend less so that we could give more. We spend time with people. We worship God fully. We uh, seek to give during seasons like this to some different ministries that we support, uh, one of them being the Joshua Fund, which reach, reaches out to people in the name of Christ um, in, in a war-torn Israel and in, um, in, in Gaza right now. They're, they're there right now, but they've always been there. They're always reaching out to people uh, in the name of Christ, to Jews and to Gentiles. So uh, we pray for them. And then the Pregnancy Resource Center here in Santa Cruz County, uh, that's just such a great ministry that ministers to uh, people that find themselves in unexpected pregnancies. I always think about it this way, that there may be um, accidental parents, but there's no accidental children. Uh, God has a plan for every life that comes into this world. Uh, we also are um, giving to For the Children. This is uh, Royal Family Kids. It ministers to foster children. Foster the City, which is a ministry, again, coming along with uh, children. All of these are, for the most part, around children. The Aruka Project, women and children that are sheltered here in Santa Cruz County from trafficking, and Calvary Bacolod, which has adopted over 180 children, um, many of them with special needs. So I want to encourage you that when, when we give, there are these red envelopes that you could pick up over at the information booth in the back, and um, this is a, a special offering specifically towards those ministries that is uh, above and beyond what I would uh, normally give. I also want to take this opportunity, we have a, we have a few weeks right now to prepare to daily walk with the Lord in Scripture. Um, how many of you have attempted to start a Bible reading plan in January? Raise your hand. Okay. How many of you have finished your reading plan throughout the year? All right. Those of you that have, that's, that's incredible. Uh, I, I, I know someone that uh, was trying to read through the Bible all the way through and uh, would get kind of stuck in Genesis and probably read Genesis about 10 times, you know, like, uh, but you could make a plan right now. Um, the, the Dwell app has a, a lot of different plans that you could listen to and you could read along the way, but start making plans right now and, and don't feel like you have to tackle the whole Bible. I, that's, that's a great practice, by the way, if you read through all of scripture, but if you don't, start somewhere and just keep going because it's the daily reading and meditation on God's word and opening your heart to prayer. Remember that the word of God helps us to, to learn to pray also. We, we read God's word and then we pray, then we read God's word and he speaks back to us through his word. So I want to encourage you. Again, uh, Advent, we are looking at Advent hope. We, we looked at how Jesus said, abide in me and I in you as the branch cannot bear fruit by itself unless it abides in the vine. Neither can you unless you abide in me. And our hope comes from abiding in Christ. In John 15, 11, Jesus said, These things I have spoken to you that my joy may be in you and that your joy may be full. Remember that joy is not the absence of conflict. We go through um, joy at times um, when, when we have sadness and joy and gladness simultaneously. It, it's not one or the other. Too often I, I would think in the past of like, I'm either going through joy or sadness. And now what I realize is that we're often going through joy and sadness. You have things that you're sad about, but there's things to be joyful about as well. And the spirit gives us the fruit of joy even in the midst of those difficulties. And then this morning we are going to look at maintaining peace in difficult times. So that is the outline that is there. Maintaining peace in difficult times. Remember that in John 14, as we've gone through the Gospel of John, uh, Jesus said, peace I leave with you. My peace I give to you. Not as the world gives do I give to you. Let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. 
There is a letting that happens when it comes to peace, and there's a letting that happens when I just let my heart go into trouble. Uh, there's a, a, a modern phrase called catastrophizing. What a cool word, right? Catastrophizing. Uh, have you ever catastrophized? Uh, I remember catastrophizing when I was in school, and I remember thinking, this final is coming up, and I'm not ready for this final. I'm going to fail this final. If I fail this final, I'm going to fail this class. I'm going to I'm going to fail this class. I'm not going to get into a good school. If I don't get into a good school, I'm not going to have a good career. If I don't have a good career, I probably can't have a family. I probably am going to end up on the streets, and I won't have any provision, and it's all because of this test. <laughs> Catastrophizing is when we take a situation that we're in right now, and we just extrapolate it as far as we can go, and we think about how bad things can get, and Jesus says, hey, I want to give you peace, but Remember, let not your hearts be troubled, neither let them be afraid. So this morning, as we consider not letting our hearts be troubled, we want to consider what does the peace of Jesus look like in our lives, and how do we experience and live out of that peace? We start with one of the most intense verses in our reading this morning and in the Gospel of John. In John 15, 18 and 19, Jesus it says, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. The context of the book of John at this point in time is Jesus' last words with his disciples before he goes to the cross. Uh, remember that the Last Supper, he served them in John 13. He washed the disciples' feet. Um, he, he served them a meal. And now he's trying to prepare them for things that are going to come in the future. And part of that preparation is he tells them, hey, things are going to get really, really difficult. Sometimes the difficulties and the trials that I go through are magnified by my shock and surprise that I'm going through them. It's like, wow, I'm going through, I'm really going through a hard time. Why am I going through a hard time? And then instead of realizing that Jesus said, you will go through a hard time and people will hate you, it's almost like we're so shocked over and over again when you do a, a nice Facebook comment that you just want to throw out there and then someone like slams you for it and you're going like, oh, the shock of that. And that's kind of why I've avoided social media for, for the last three years so much. Um, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it has hated you. Now, the word world, uh, there are different contexts at times where this word means things. The word world means the created world. Um, so God created the world. Uh, we have our, our earth. That's, that's the word world. It also means all of humanity, for God so loved the world. He loved people. He loved all of humanity. But then here, the world order or world system, the world values, the world philosophies, the world's plans, people living in opposition to God's values and order and plans and to the person of Christ, that word cosmos at times is what Jesus is referring, that the world, if the world hates you, know that it has hated me before it hated you. In 1 John 2, 15 through 17, um, it, John writes, do not love the world or the things in the world. All that is in the world, the lust of the eyes, the lust of the flesh, the pride of life, you know, these things, they, they wage war with our souls. Uh, Romans 12, 1 and 2 says, do not be conformed to the world. One time I had, um, there were, I had this putty, it was a, uh, it was like a grip strengthening putty. So what you do is, you know, you have those forearm grip things. Well, it's this putty to strengthen your hands, and, and um, it, it's really difficult. It's not like Play-Doh. It, it's a, a hard putty. And uh, I was teaching through Romans 12, 1 and 2, and what I did is I put the putty up on the, on the pulpit, and by the end of the message, it had just melted and conformed to the shape of whatever it was on. And that's kind of what the world does to us. Um, often it's, it's without knowing it. Often it's just being in close physical proximity or letting things in, and it's very subtle, especially when it comes in the form of a story or entertainment. You could, you could watch a, a show, a movie, or read a book, or listen to a song, and there's a catchy tune. There's something that draws you in. There's a character that you feel like an affinity towards, but then later on that character is so antithetical to the ways of God, but you come to like this character, and then you come to think, 
well, maybe it's not so bad. And slowly this confirmation conforming to the world begins to take place. In verse 19, he says, if you were of the world, the world would love you as its own. But because you are not of the world, but I chose you out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Why does the world hate you? Um, There is a growing animosity in our world today uh, towards Christians. The the persecution, sometimes we look back at uh, the early church, the first century, uh, Rome, and how um, how, uh, Rome was so against Christians and feeding Christians to the lions, and you, you read about martyrs, but realize that around the world, there's a growing animosity towards Christians And you wonder, like, what is that? What is behind it? Well, first of all, Jesus says that the world hates you because it hated me first. Um, Also realize this, you're not of the world, you're different. As human beings, we don't do well um, naturally with difference. Different is something to be afraid of. Different is something to be judged as other than, less than, and so whether we are Christians or not, that difference at times causes people to say, hey, you're so different, I don't like you, or I'm coming against you. But I wanna think about this particularly, what is it about Jesus that the world hates? That's a confusing question to me. It's confusing because I think about the values of Jesus and what he came to bring love. For God so loved the world, he gave his own, Jesus loved us so much, he gave his life. I think about joy, my joy. Jesus gives us his joy. I I speak these things to you that my joy would be in you and your joy would be made full. Okay, what about hope? Jesus came to bring hope. And what is it about hope that causes this hatred or this anger? And what is it about Jesus's peace, my peace I leave with you that would cause someone to say, I hate you or I hate Jesus or I hate what that represents? Well, there are a few things. I don't think that we can get all of them in a message, but I think one of the things that I've seen personally, loveless, joyless, peaceless, and hopeless people get very annoyed and angry at those who have peace, hope, love, and joy when it seems like to them it is so far out of their reach. And the reason why I know that is because I've been that. There are times when someone is so joyful and I'm not, and I don't want to be around that person. Their joy actually frustrates me or annoys me, and, and they're like, hey, what's going on? And so, you know, like their joy, it's like, hey, uh, I, I just want to have a group of people that are angry like me, and, it, and then I can have company with them, or sad like me, or hopeless like me. You know, we throw out those pity party uh, invitations and we want people to come that are just like us. I think that's a part of it. I think there's another part of it that we live in a spiritual battle. The thief comes only to rob, kill, and destroy. There is um, an empowerment, uh, uh, an animated force in our world of evil that is there. That, that sometimes you even wonder, like, why is that person so harsh against me or against Christ. There's, there is an animated force in our world of evil. But I, I also think that there's something about the truth of Christ. Jesus said, I am the way, the truth, and the life. No one comes to the Father except through me. That exclusivity really causes people to get very angry because why would, why not any way to God? Why, why can't I choose a way? Why can't it be my way? The way that, uh, the path that I've chosen, the path that I've built, the way that I want to approach God. See, one of the things that Gary Brashears, uh, my professor, uh, would talk about is um, throughout Scripture, especially when you study the Old Testament and worship, you can't approach Yahweh just any old way you please. There's a way to approach God. If God is God, God is holy, set apart other than, and there's a way to approach him, I can't just come into his presence the way that I feel like it. Imagine just traipsing into a foreign country to their king or their president 
without any kind of decorum, without any kind of security check, without any kind of stopping, and you just walk right in however you want to walk, you get taken down on an earthly king. God who is holy says, hey, there is a way to approach me. And in his love, Christ becomes that way. See, when it comes to receiving Christ, the truth is that Christ must be received humbly. And I really believe one of the greatest deterrents to receiving Christ is pride. Our pride that we have to humble ourselves to say, I need your help. I need your forgiveness. Uh, I need you to come into my life and to change me comes at the root of our pride to say, I don't need any help. I don't need any handout. I don't need anyone. And so therefore, if you tell me that I am needy, then I'm going to fight you with everything that I have. So there are all of these dynamics at place that we can't hit all of them, but I think that that's one of them. We have to approach God humbly. And therefore, because Christ chose us out of the world, therefore the world hates you. Shane Claiborne said this, if the world hates us, we take courage that it hated Jesus first. If you're wondering whether you'll be safe, just look at what they did to Jesus and those who followed him. There are safer ways to live than by being a Christian. Um, it's been said before, and, and uh, maybe you've said it. I, I've said it at some times in the past. The safest place to be is in the center of God's will. And it depends on what I mean by safe. If, if the safest place to be is in the center of God's will, and I'm saying that no harm will befall me, no one will come against me, then I'm not really taking what Scripture is saying. I'm taking my own human, human understanding of what it means to follow God. And, and maybe you've heard it as like the health, wealth, prosperity doctrine. And you follow God, then every, all the arrows go up and to the right. Your relationships, your money, your finances, your health, everything is going to get better. But it doesn't happen that way. In fact, sometimes to follow Christ means that your life got harder in many ways. Safe, yes, I feel safe in God's care because nothing comes to me except through the filter of God's sovereignty and love and grace. I, I realize that he's with me through heartache and pain and difficulty. Yes, safe in that way. But at the same time, when it comes to a physical safety or a safety in this world, I, I think that we misread it if we look at the Gospels and we think that to follow Jesus means that he um, rescues us from all harm. In verse 20, it says, Remember, the word that I said to you, a servant is not greater than his master. If they persecuted me, they will also persecute you. And, and I don't know if you read that and you go, okay, that is scary. If they persecuted Jesus, they're going to persecute me. It's scary, but for me, it's also comforting. It's comforting in the sense that I'm not alone. It's comforting in the sense that there is someone who has gone before me. Um, sometimes I, I, I think about how um, if you've uh, watched a Band of Brothers, it's a Stephen Ambrose book that turned into a miniseries. In Band of Brothers, there was this one captain, and I can't remember his name, but he is just sending the troops out into battle. Go, get them, go. And he's just sending them out, and they're just getting mowed down by the Nazis. They're just getting mowed down, this machine. And he's just, go, you go, you go. But that uh, officer is so afraid of going that he's hiding, and he won't go out there. And then there's another character. There's another person in real life. It's based on a true story. Um, of the 82nd Airborne, there's another captain that runs out, and his name is uh, actually Lieutenant, Lieutenant Spears. And I remember Lieutenant Spears. I remember watching that scene, and Lieutenant Spears, they're trying to send men out into the battle, and no one wants to go, and Lieutenant Spears jumps over the wall and starts running, just running into the battle, into the direction that the troops are supposed to go. And all of a sudden, because Lieutenant Spears jumps this wall and runs out on the battlefield, it inspires the courage of some of the other men. Then they start jumping out over the, the wall and they start going and they, they, they go into the place that they need to secure. I think Jesus saying, hey, if they persecuted me, they will persecute you also. Um, he comes down into our world. God comes down into our world to suffer 
so that anything that you go through is not something that you say, well, you don't understand. Because as God up in heaven, you don't understand what it's like when people come against you. When people, you try to love them and they actually hate you. You try to serve them and they beat you. Jesus says, they've persecuted me, they will persecute you also. If they kept my word, they would also keep yours. But all these things they will do to you on account of my name because they do not know him who sent me. Again, when I think about this uptick in animosity towards Christians at times, there is a a book, not a Christian book, uh, it's by Bill Bishop, it's called The Big Sort. The Big Sort is a book, um, I want you to listen to the subtitle of this book, The Big Sort, Why the Clustering of Like-Minded America is Tearing Us Apart. So think about this, this clustering. Uh, In it, there's a quote, he says, we have become geographically and demographically stratified in recent decades. We are surrounded by people who live like us, think like us, vote like us, and see the world as we do. All the while we are more isolated than ever, we are reaping the seeds of the modern self that has sown in the modern self a lonely self. As cultural alienation and stratification set in, we lose those trace infinitesimal opportunities to be influenced by those with whom we differ. Robust communities have always offered humans opportunities to be changed by a variety of sources, but now we are brainwashing ourselves by likeness. A pastor named Stephen Foster explained his own annoyance with Christians just as he was becoming one. Now, before I show this video clip, I just want to consider this quote. Cultural alienation and stratification has set in, and we lose those infinitesimal, those small opportunities to be influenced by those with whom we differ. When that happens, as it has in the past, especially the past three years since COVID, right? Think about those three years. And then everyone being isolated, alone, a part of community, I mean, uh, not a part of, but apart from community, not gathering together on devices, on technology, on social media, doing searches that only give back to them a reflection of themselves, ourselves, and the things that we like and the things that we have watched, we get more of the same, and the stratification happens and the separation happens, and it becomes more and more us versus them. And so as a Christian trying to follow Christ, the more that there are videos out there about deconstruction, about the evils of Christianity, about uh, pastors who are evil in their motivation or evil bad things that Christians have done, and, and if someone watches that and then they watch another video about it, they don't even realize that they're gonna get more of those videos. And the more videos that they get about those things, when they search on different topics, will get back this algorithm that in their minds, they're seeing things clearly. Now, before I cast blame on others, Christians are no different. There are times that we could see other people as the others, and instead of seeing them as people who are created in the image of God that God loves and wants us to reach out to, we could see them as the enemy that we are against. Christ came into the world. He came into the world that was... Uh, with animosity toward him. He came into a world that hated him. And what did he do? He loved them in return. What did he do? He showed them his grace. And even to those who killed him, he said, Father, forgive them, for they do not know what they're doing. See, it's Christ that we have to look at, not other Christians or other people that maybe have not exemplified Christ. I wanna show you A quick video of a pastor named Stephen Foster. Um, And and Stephen Foster talks about in this short video what it was like when he first became a Christian and really didn't like Christians. All right, I'm gonna show this. Here we go. If I'm honest, I never really liked the church. I didn't even really like Christians that much. I used to think of it like a package deal. Like, you get Jesus... And so you get the church and Christians thrown. It's just part of the package. And uh, there are some bits you like, Jesus, some bits you don't like so much. Just like the church and Christians um, used to find that a bit annoying. But I'd turn up to church and go through it. But I didn't really enjoy going to church. And then one day, uh, I was at the back 
of our church in East London and someone said to me, oh, we need help to run the coffee team. And I was like, I was like working like 70, 80 hour week. I'm like, what? And they were like, yeah, we, Steve, we really need your help running the coffee team on a Sunday. And I was like, I'm a barrister, I'm not a barista. Like, I've got a job, I don't need another job to run a coffee team. But I just, you know, sometimes you just can't even think of what to say. So I was like, okay, I'll do it, I'll do it, okay. And, and I instantly thought, why did I do that? So I turn up next week, like, you know, trying to get the cups and everything, get the coffee right. As I handed these cups to people, who, something really changed in me. I found myself, as I handed coffee to these people, growing in love for them. I was like, these people are amazing. Like this is this extraordinarily diverse community. It's been gathered from across the area. It's probably not another place that looks as diverse and integrated as this. This is a miracle. And then I, even people I found a little bit more frustrating and complicated, as I handed them their coffee, I kind of grew in love with them. And I kind of basically fell in love with the church. And then I kind of went back to the person who'd asked me to do it. I said, we need a new coffee machine. We need better beans. We need better mugs. Like, we come on, these are amazing people. I want this to be the best coffee that they get. You know, they, they're coming to church on a Sunday morning. I got more and more passionate. I started to build a team to serve coffee on a Sunday morning. I sometimes say, making coffee changed my life because I fell in love with the Church of Jesus Christ. I didn't realize why it was special. I didn't realize why it mattered. And as I made coffee for people, I suddenly realized, oh, the church is like, the bride of Jesus Christ. It's like the thing he gave himself for. Like the church is God's plan for the salvation of the world. There's no plan B and God is going to build his church and the gates of hell will not prevail against it. So like God is putting all his eggs in the church basket. And I realized over those few weeks, there's a beautiful thing here. Yes, it messes up. Yes, it makes mistakes. You'll never find a perfect church but it's a beautiful thing. And I thought, that's what I want to spend my life building. If I'm honest, I never really Yeah, wasn't that amazing? Man, when I, when I watched that, I got choked up because I think of you. I, 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 love, I love you guys. I love the church. I love the fact that we're different. I even love the fact that there's brokenness. I love the fact that there are times when we don't look like how we're supposed to look, but by God's grace, we're still here. You know, one of the things he said, I began to realize that this is the most diverse community. It really is a miracle. Look around at people around you and you go, I would never know this person. I would never want to talk to this person. They're different. They don't look like me. They don't, they're a different age. They have different style. They don't, you know, like, like why? Why are we together? We're together because in God's grace, he loved us. He reached out to us. See, not only should we see the church in that way, and, and I just, I love the fact that it was when Stephen was serving others that he began to see them as humans, as people. He began to notice them. And even the people that were more complicated and difficult, he began to say, I really love them, and this is a miraculous thing. I'm not at all saying that the church is perfect. There are, there's going to be faults and there's going to be difficulties but find any other community where you break the rules of that community and you're still accepted back. Find any other place where you break the rules of that community and you go against their tenets, their beliefs, their values, and they still welcome you in. See, I think that the church is this amazing thing, but I want to encourage us as the church, as God's people, also to realize this. When we begin to serve people outside of the church that are different than us, don't look like us, don't act like us, and have different values, our hearts of compassion for them begins to grow as well. We were out um, on Pacific Avenue, downtown Santa Cruz on, on Friday night, and we were uh, singing, we're doing Christmas carols, and uh, <laughs> I thought it was really funny. Uh, as, as sometimes as we're singing, there, there are people that literally are like, oh, like who are these people singing? Like they're going around us. And then there's other people that are like, oh, that's cool, they're singing. Then we'd go up to stores and we would say, hey, we're, we're singing, we're, you know, we're walking down Pacific Avenue, we're caroling, would you mind if we open your doors and we sang to you? Oh, go ahead. And they would open up the doors and we would just start singing. And then you would see some people start to sing as well. Uh, when we were in front of Nick the Greeks, there was this table of, of young, you know, these young guys, like in their early 20s, maybe teenagers, and they all, they started clapping and they stood up inside the restaurant. They started singing from inside the restaurant, and whether they knew the lyrics or not, 
And, and then uh, we had these tables that were set up and uh, a sign that says, need prayer. And we're giving out jackets and gloves. And you just start conversations with people and you realize people are people. And it doesn't matter who those people are, whether they realize it or not. Those are people created in the image of God, that God loves and that God is drawing towards himself. So we, we have a lot to learn, a lot to grow in, but so important that, yes, it says in verse 22, if I had not come and spoken to them, they would have not been guilty of sin, but now they have no excuse for their sin. Um, I, I think about things that Jesus said. I did not come into, into the world to condemn the world, right? But that the world through Christ might be saved. I, I think of Jesus saying, I'm the bread of life. I think of Jesus saying, I'm the water. I'm the, the well. I'm the living water. I'm the truth. I think about all of these words that Jesus gives and there's no excuse, and we live in a world that is, the very concept of sin is offensive to people. I think that that's another thing, that's this barrier. Not that we're better than others, but I think that as a Christian, um, I, we had a conversation this last week with some people that are a part of recovery ministry. I, I used to be a part of uh, Advent, um, Advent Ministries, which is a started a charter school in Morgan Hill in Gilroy that was uh, for students that were incarcerated for drugs and alcohol. They were sentenced to be there by drug court. And I remember sitting in the classroom as the addiction counselor would come and sit there and the, the students would go through this uh, recovery program. And I'm listening to these students and I'm realizing, hey, they have a lot of things that are similar to me. Different background. And I started to realize that we all have this addiction to sin all of us have this pride, and that very first step is admitting what? You got a problem. I have a problem. But when, when the world says, no, I don't have a problem, I don't have sin, there's nothing wrong with me, the, the very essence of the word sin becomes offensive to them. But realize this, God sees us and our sinfulness, our brokenness, even the things that you've done this last week, this morning, the way you've treated people, the thoughts that you've had, the actions that you've done, and he bids you to come anyway because he loves you. But you gotta deal with that because that separates us. There's a barrier. It's kind of like, can you imagine two friends and, and one of them just gossiped about the other friend, told this lie about this friend, and then realizes, oh, I shouldn't have done that, but then just wants to be friends again without addressing the problem between them. And the friend that was hurt Maybe it is still loving, but, but if there's reconciliation for two people, both people have to come to that place. And the person has to recognize, hey, that's something that I've, I've done. Because of Jesus' world, uh, words, the world is guilty. Um, it says, whoever hates me hates my father also. But then he goes on to say this, if I had, if I had not done among them the works that no one else did, they would not be guilty of sin, but now they have seen and hated both me and my father. Notice Jesus, if you consider these verses together, his words and his works. His words, come to me, all who are weary and heavy laden, I'll give you rest. Uh, his words, repent, come to me, change your mind, uh, follow me, turn away from your, your sinfulness. Then his works, I love you, he's feeding people, he's healing people, he's doing all these different things. Do you think today more people are against Christ because of his words or because of his works? Because of the words. But I want you to see that Jesus' words match his works. And as much as possible for those of us that are followers of Christ, we must try to live so that our words and our works match. We will fall short and we'll blow it. And when we blow it, we should confess that. And we should just say, hey, I messed up. I'm sorry. We, we should just be really clear about that. But I want you to notice with Jesus, it's different because in verse 25, but the word that was written in their law must be fulfilled. They hated me without a cause. Sometimes people can hate me with cause. <laughs> you know, like if I do something to hurt them or if, if we do something that falls short and they say, well, I thought you were a Christian. I see the way that you live. With Jesus, there is no cause. There is no division between the words that he says and his works and what he does. There are people that hated him without cause. 
Again, there are those who have experienced church hurt from Christians or from churches that were sinful and shameful in the things that have been done. But I wanna encourage you, if that's your experience, don't give up on following Jesus because someone did something to hurt you. Don't give up on following Jesus. And also don't give up on the church because like you saw in that video from Stephen, realize the church is made up of people and wherever people are, there are going to be broken people and there's going to be sin. And so again, I'm not saying, hey, uh, find a, uh, you know, if there's a, a person that just keeps hurting you or a church that just keeps doing these things, no, don't just make yourself susceptible, but don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. Have you heard that phrase? Don't throw the baby out with the bathwater. It's kind of a crazy phrase um, uh, on, on a tangent. Uh, there would be one bathtub and they would fill it up, you know, they'd pump the water from outside or get it from a well. And so as they would wash the babies, wash the kids from the oldest to the youngest, the time that that last baby is there, you can't even see the bottom of the water. It's just dirty water that baby's in. You throw out the bath water and like, oh, the baby's in it. Like, don't throw the baby out with the bath water. And you might see a lot of the scum from, from uh, the residual of, of people's lives, but don't throw the baby out with the bath water. Hey, isn't that a cool, that, that, that's a Christmas theme, right? Don't, <laughs> Verses 20, 26 and 27. When the helper comes, the Holy Spirit, the Holy Spirit will help you to understand these things, to see these things. When the helper comes, whom I will send you from the Father, the Spirit of truth who proceeds from the Father, he will bear witness about me. He's gonna bear witness about me. Um, the more that we seek God and we say, God, help me to understand you, the helper comes. We open ourselves up and the Holy Spirit uh, teaches us. In verse 27, and you also will bear witness because you have been with me from the beginning. So we, how do we bear witness? We bear witness by reflecting the grace and the truth of God. Uh, Jesus uh, in John 1 um, is full of grace and truth. And we need to be full of grace and truth. If we're just a truth and we just say, hey, that's the truth. Um, I, I've, I've seen people post before and I've even seen bumper stickers. My truth doesn't care about your feelings. Doesn't, that doesn't sound very empathetic or sympathetic or loving. Truth is truth, but in grace, you reach out to people. Jesus continued to reach out to people with grace and truth. So, the helper will help us to do that, to bear witness of Christ. And then he says, I have said these things to you to keep you from falling away. How many of you have felt at times that this is just so hard to be a Christian? It's just so difficult. So difficult to treat people with love when they're treating me in this way. I'm going through these trials. And Jesus is saying, hey, I'm telling you these things to keep you from falling away. They will put you out of synagogues. Indeed, the hour is coming when whoever kills you will think he is offering service to God. What blows me away is that Saul of Tarsus, that we know as Paul the Apostle, felt like he was doing the same thing. By killing and persecuting Christians, he felt like he was doing God a service. And Jesus is saying these things to us so that we're not surprised by them and it keeps us from falling away. The hour is coming. And then he says this in verses three and four, and they will do these things because they have not known the Father nor me. But I have said these things to you that when their hour comes, you may remember that I told them to you. Again, this warning because he loves us. Now, as we close, I wanna leave us with some very, very practical things that we could take this truth into our own lives during this Advent Christmas season have you guys ever seen this warning sign? I've seen that warning sign in different beaches. Um, there, there really, um, there are certain beaches, especially in Northern California and in Oregon, that certain beaches, not as much on the East Coast. I mean, it could happen anywhere, but mostly there's certain beaches that they have um, realized that there are what are called sneaker waves. There are waves that the waves are all at a certain height all at a certain force and power like two foot waves they're not that strong and then out of nowhere this giant wave will come in it'll go farther than the other waves and it'll be more powerful than the other waves and the signs that are placed 
on beaches, say, deadly sneaker waves and hazardous surf. And I have never been at a beach where I've seen that sign and I've seen a sneaker wave come in. I've seen sneaker waves, but I haven't seen them where there's a beach with those signs. It's easy to see that sign as a needless sign. It's easy to see that and ignore that sign and just think, okay, it's okay because these other waves are of this certain height, this certain power. When Jesus talks about these difficulties that we are going through, that we will face, a part of it is that I think that he's trying to warn us from some of the sneaker waves of life. Because when the trials hit and someone attacks you verbally or emotionally or even physically out of the blue, it, it catches you off guard. It's like if you've ever lost your breath because you've gotten hit in the stomach and you can't breathe anymore. It's like I can't breathe because I wasn't expecting that. I wasn't bracing for it. I wasn't ready to dodge it or to, to try to deflect it. It just, it just hits you out of the blue. And some of us have been through some of those sneaker waves that we weren't expecting, especially during a season like Advent and Christmas. And I want to encourage you that Jesus told us ahead of time these things would happen so that when they happen, we wouldn't be caught by surprise or taken away. See, there is a peace with God. And we're going to have an opportunity in a few moments. I'll, I'm not yet, but I'm going to have the worship team come up. And, and here's some practical ways that I want to consider this. First of all, it's peace with God. Peace with God. In Romans chapter 5, we have peace with God through Christ. We, we realize that there is a peace with God that happens when we say, Jesus, I need you. Would you forgive me? God, I have sinned. God, I, I see areas of my life that are out of control. I see pride in my own life. There's things that I don't like about myself. See, sometimes the phrase hurt people, hurt people, you know that phrase? Sometimes when we're hurt by people, we begin to hurt other people. And when we begin to hurt other people, oftentimes we begin to hurt other people and we feel badly about ourselves and we don't know what to do. What do I do with this guilt? What do I do with this shame? Well, Jesus says, come and bring it to me. Come and bring it to me because I love you and I see you and I wanna heal you. I wanna take care of you. So maybe some of us need that peace with God. And maybe it's you've never received Christ or Maybe you're walking with Christ, but there have been things recently in your life that you just feel so badly about, you don't even want to bring it up to God. You just feel like it's too bad, I just want to ignore it. And making peace with God, he's there on the other side bidding you to come. He's, he's looking towards you, not to, not, not to like push you down or stomp you out, but because he loves you. Um, when my kids were little, I always wanted them um, especially if it was a restoration of something that they did wrong. They got in a fight with their sibling, and then now, now hey, I, I just want you to know it's okay, I love you, or, or it's okay, like, you're forgiven. Hey, would you look at me? Because I want them to see my eyes. And God wants to lift your head. He wants you to see him as he is, and to realize that maybe I was thinking he was gonna look at me with a scowl on his face, and he looks at me with eyes that are reaching out to me, eyes of compassion. But there's not just the peace with God, there's the peace of God. In the scripture that Jenny read earlier from Philippians, sometimes we think of um, peace that a person can go through in the middle of trials. You know people that are like that, that are more steady. They go through hard times, and some people, a hard trial will just knock them down. There's other people, they just seem to be kind of steady. It's still hard, but they steady as she goes. She just, like, they, they just are able to wade through the waves. And so it's easy to think it's just their personality or their demeanor or their natural disposition. But in Philippians, Paul said, I have learned the secret of being content. Paul didn't say that I was born out of the womb content at a place of peace, he said, I learned the secret. And if you read earlier in Philippians, it's to set his mind on, to think on things that are true and good and pure and just, lovely, excellent, worthy of praise. Think on these things. 
And when we do that, the peace of God begins to fill us. I want, I want to give you three resources for peace of God during these difficult times. So we looked at peace with God. This is the peace of God. For Christians, suffering can have meaning and purpose. My suffering can actually have meaning and purpose. I remember Tim Keller in one of his books, Walking with God Through Pain and Suffering, um, talked about how suffering comes to all people. It doesn't matter what your faith background is or no faith at all. But for the Christian, we could look at a Romans 8, 28, that not all things are good, but God causes all things to work together for the good of those who love him and are called according to his purpose. I realize now that as a Christian, suffering can actually make me more empathetic to other sufferers. Suffering can make me relate to Christ more during times when I'm having a hard time and I go, wow, Jesus, thank you for what you've gone through on my behalf. For the Christian, we don't suffer alone. Jesus understands our suffering. Um, I think about Buddhism, which tries to get to a place of nirvana where outside circumstances don't touch us. It's detachment, detached from troubles and hardship. And again, I'm not degrading people that have that philosophy. I'm just saying that in that philosophy, I see a weakness. Because if I try to detach from everything that brings me stress or pain or hardship, I won't have many people that have hurt me in my life at all. I'll cancel them. I'll act like they don't exist. I won't talk to them because they cause me pain. And I'm so thankful Jesus didn't do that, that he entered into our pain on our behalf. And thirdly, for the peace of God, for the Christian, there will be an end to suffering. I want to read just a portion of this scripture in Revelation. It blows me away every time I read it. In Revelation 20. One, it says, I, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away and the sea was no more. And I saw the holy city, New Jerusalem, coming down out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride adorned for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, behold, the dwelling place of God is with man. He will dwell with them and they will be his people and God himself will be with them as their God. And he will wipe away every tear from their eyes and death shall be no more. Neither shall there be mourning, nor crying, nor pain anymore, for the former things have passed away. See, for us as followers of Christ, we have a resource to deal with our suffering. And finally, when it comes to um, making peace, it's being a peacemaker for God. We looked at peace with God, peace of God, and now being a peacemaker for God. And Jesus tells us in the Sermon on the Mount, blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. We, we, we reflect the Father as, as sons and daughters of the King when we become peacemakers. And how do you become a peacemaker? You have to enter into the conflict. You have to enter into the relationship. You reach out to someone else. And may I suggest something that I'm learning too late in life that I wish I would have learned earlier is ask more questions and listen. Just ask more questions and listen. When I, I look at the Gospels, um, I, I, I can't remember the exact number, but it's, I think it's 300 something times that Jesus asks questions. And there are only a few times when he asks a question and gives the answer. When you ask questions, it causes someone to think and it also tells them that you care enough to listen. And, and I'm, I'm the answer man. I just want to fix it. Like, show me what the problem is so that I could fix it. And there are times that I might even, here's the crazy thing, I might even have the answer. In fact, most of the time I probably do. I, I know how to fix it. I'm a mechanic in a car, and you come up to me in your car with these knocks and pings, and I look at that, and the, you open up the, the hood, and you're looking at it going, like, I don't know what's wrong, and I just go, man, that must be hard. I feel for you. I hate when my car breaks down. And I have to wait until the person says, hey, do you think you could help me fix this? Sure, I can. Oh, too often, I just come right into it and say, hey, I know your problem, and I know what's going on, and here's how to fix it. And like sometimes they're just like, hey, I just want you to know that I'm hurting or I'm going through a difficulty. And with that empathy, you enter in. Be a peacemaker. It doesn't mean you leave truth behind. It means that you pick and choose those opportunities where the Holy Spirit opens the door. Amen?
So as the worship team comes up and we begin to respond to this message, the first one, maybe this morning you need to make peace with God. There is some thing that you are holding on to as a barrier between you and God. And God is saying, hey, I want to help you. I want to deal with those things. I want to draw near to you. But maybe you've never received Christ and you've never said, Jesus, forgive me. I realize that there is something called sin and um, at times I've gone my own way. At times I've hurt others. At times I just, I don't like myself. And I'm trying to fix myself so that I'm acceptable to you or acceptable to others. And God just says, no, just come as you are. Just come as you are and let me clean you up. Let me wrap my loving arms around you. Let me fill you with my spirit. And you could sense the comfort of the comforter. This morning, there are some of you here or online that need to make peace with God. You might even be a believer that you've already received Christ But there's something in your life that you are just not willing to bring to God. And it's causing you to not want to draw near to him in intimacy because you're ashamed or you feel just like this is so hard because then you're just going to see me as I am. God says, I already see you. I already see you. And I'm inviting you. Secondly, um, There are some people that need the peace of God. You're going through a really hard time. A relational hurt, someone that you love, a a loneliness, a a sense of catastrophic things that have happened in your life with your health, your finances. Some of you need the, the, the peace of God because you are going through a time of grief. And God says, hey, I, I see what you're going through and I wanna come near to you and I love you. And finally, there are those that God is showing you where there's a conflict and he wants you to be a peacemaker. He wants you to reflect him by making peace, helping someone else. Maybe, maybe it's between a brother and sister in Christ that they just don't talk and you're friends with both of them. They just don't talk to each other anymore. Maybe God is ca- calling you to see how you might be able to help. Um, See, we don't want to be peacemakers because then we don't want anyone to be mad at us. So they're mad at each other and I see that or there's hurt there and I could probably do something, but I'm, no way. I'm not going to go into that. And Jesus is saying, hey, when you become a peacemaker, you're, you're like a child of God. You, re- you represent me. So I'm going to pray. And in one of these three areas, if one of these applies to you, I'm going to pray for each one of them. You could just raise your hand where you are If you're at home, I would encourage you to do this because sometimes a physical outward expression um, is is a sign of an inward thing that is happening in our hearts. And when we do that, it's like saying, hey, I'm I'm here, God, and I'm, I'm, I'm just saying, here I am. So let's pray. Father, first of all, I pray for those that need to make peace with you, both those that have never received Christ And Lord, those of us that have, that maybe there is something in our lives that we're saying, God, we don't want to deal with it. It's too painful or difficult or shameful. And we want to be rightly related to you. We want to be rightly related in a way that we just come as we are because you see us anyway. So if there's anyone here or if you're online, you could let us know, but wherever you are, you need to make peace with God, would you raise your hand where you are and just say, God, I, I need to make peace with you. I need your peace. I want to make peace with you, God. I don't want anything between me and you. Don't want any relational distance because you see it anyway. I'm, I'm raising my hand with you. There's some things that I just need to make peace with God. He knows already. He loves you. So, Father, for those that have their hands up, God, those that are at home in their cars, we, we just... First of all, for anyone that has never received you, that they would open up their hearts. They would say, Jesus, come into my life. Thank you that you came into this world to die for my sins, to suffer so that you could understand my suffering. And I receive you and and I pray that you would receive me because of what Christ has done. Fill me with your spirit. May the comforter, the Holy Spirit, indwell my life. 
regenerate me. And Father, for those of us that have already followed you, we, we just have these things that we just need to deal with and we bring it before you. We need your help. We thank you that you are the peacemaker. God, we make peace with you by just confessing, just sharing things that have gotten in the way. Amen. Father, for those that need the peace of God, they're just going through this season, this difficulty, this time in their lives, God, where they know truth and they believe and they know that you're there, but they're not sensing, feeling that peace. And God, we need your peace. Even as Paul said, I have learned the secret that God, we would meditate on these truths that Jesus, you, you could cause purpose and meaning to come from our, our pain and suffering. And Jesus, you walk through things with us, alongside of us. And God, we just thank you that for our suffering and pain, there will be an end if we follow you and receive and hold you as Savior. So God, we come to you. We need your peace. If you just need peace of God to fill your heart right now in a tumultuous time, raise your hand. And God sees, he knows. God, you see hearts, you see what's going on. We need your peace. And then finally, for those that you see conflict in people that you love and maybe you've been afraid. You don't want to approach anyone because you're afraid of how they will respond to you. And Jesus may be calling you to be a peacemaker. Maybe it's someone that you've hurt. Maybe it's someone that maybe because of your actions or words that that person is going through distress and and you're not sure if you could do anything about it. You're not sure if they would even receive your apology or you trying to make peace. But God, they, these people are willing to say, Lord, whatever you tell me to do, I want to be faithful to do that. So if God is calling you and he's showing you a conflict that maybe the Spirit is leading you to wade into instead of running away from, would you lift your hand before the Lord and just ask for his help? Say, Jesus, I see conflict that maybe I can be used by you to bring peace into. You would help me to do that. Give me faith and courage and give me enough love to overcome my fear. So this morning, Lord, we thank you that you are our peace. Help us to maintain that peace by walking with you in difficult times. We love you and we pray these things in Jesus' name, amen. Amen, I wanna encourage you that if you are here this would desire prayer just to make it a normal thing of just asking for prayer often over in the back on um, the prayer area there are people that uh, we would love to pray with you and if you're online and you have a prayer request let us know and we would like to pray with you let's let's worship the lord together